Mr. President. Senator from Illinois. Mr. President, I was here for the uh, presentation by the Republican leader, and I'm happy that he returned. I, I told him it was great to see him back, and I couldn't wait to disagree with him. And I'm sure he'll have that opportunity in the near future. Mr. President, I spent the August recess crisscrossing the state of Illinois. It's a pretty big operation. One tip to the other, about 350 miles, and a couple hundred miles across. And I tried to make a point of not only visiting the population center, Chicago, and the suburbs around it, but to get downstate, too. And my focus downstate was to visit small towns in rural areas and to go to the hospitals and to sit down with the administrator and ask him what was going on with that local hospital. You know this from the state you represent, Mr. President. These small town hospitals are really the lifeline for these communities. They're great sources of pride. They're great sources of employment. They're there for critical medical care. And God forbid you lose one. It really is devastating to a community. And I found as I went around the state and sat down with hospital leaders and public health officials and other health care providers, several messages came through loud and clear. We spoke about the struggling rural hospitals, and it applies to the hospitals in urban areas as well. Not only lifelines for emergency medical care, they are the backbone of the local economy in these communities. But nationwide, rural hospitals in particular are really struggling. Half operate in the red. They're losing money. And more than 300 across the nation are at immediate risk of closure. I had a memorable visit to Iroquois County, Illinois. Now that's south of Chicago, south of Kankakee. And I went to the hospital that has been there for decades and a great source of pride. They really worried when they contacted our office that they wouldn't be able to keep the lights on in that hospital. So we worked to help them obtain something called critical access hospital status under Medicare. And several of the community leaders, when I went there to make the announcement that they'd been approved, said, we saved the hospital with that common effort. Now, I have a bipartisan bill with Senator James Lankford. Senator Langford and I are as opposite politically as they come in this chamber. He's a Republican of Oklahoma and very conservative. But he has joined me in extending the lifeline to additional rural hospitals facing closure. Our bill will create some flexibility around the strict federal definitions that a hospital must be literally 35 miles or more away from others to qualify for payment designation. Senator Langford and I believe that characteristics of the hospital and its role in the community should also be factors in determining eligibility. I hope the Finance Committee will take this up now and take it seriously. We can save dozens of hospitals nationwide, preserving vital access to patients in rural areas. But my number one takeaway from hospitals in the city of Chicago, the suburbs, and downstate was very simple. We are facing a dramatic shortage of health care providers. Doctors, nurses, dentists, mental health providers, EMTs, and lab techs. Across the country, we face a shortfall of 120,000 doctors over the next 10 years. A recent survey found that 100,000 doctors left the field during pandemic and another 800,000, 800,000 planning to retire soon. This is particularly dire in rural communities. I do want to give a shout out to Illinois State University, located in Bloomington Normal. They just opened a nursing school in my hometown of Springfield, Illinois. It's called the Mennonite School of Nursing. It has a great reputation, and it's going to be a success, I'm sure, because we need them desperately and they anticipate graduating over 90 nurses a year. We need them in central Illinois. In every single Illinois rural county, every one, we face a shortage of medical professionals. For example, mental health providers and recovery experts. And while there are 90 doctors for 100,000 residents in the urban parts of my state, in the rural counties, we have only 45 physicians 
for every 100,000. That's 50%. What's the consequence of this shortage of medical professionals? It's very real and it's very personal. We have a new mayor in Carbondale, Illinois. Her name is Carolyn Harvey. She worked for Southern Illinois University at Carbondale for her working life, retired there, and then went to work on the city council and became the mayor. I sat down with Mayor Harvey and I said to her, okay, you have the United States Senator sitting in your mayor's office in Carbondale, Illinois. What's your ask? Everybody has one. She shocked me. Her ask was not for money. It wasn't for anything particular to the community and infrastructure. She said one thing, we need dentists for children, pediatric dentistry. I heard from Shawnee Health, which is the community health clinic in her hometown of, Spring of Carbondale. They treat nearly 50,000 low income patients each year. Just for the record, that's 1,000 a, a month that they are treating in this clinic. They recently, after the pandemic, lost 15 oral health professionals. They have a waiting list of 120 children to access dental care, most of whom are under the age of eight. This means that a three-year-old girl in Southern Illinois who has trouble sleeping because of severe tooth decay has to wait more than one year for treatment. What does treatment consist of at the end of waiting for a year for a little kid? It consists of going into an operating room in a hospital under general anesthesia, and they find a medical professional to extract a bad tooth. Think of the complications, the drama that are part of regular oral care in that region. Here's another story they shared with me about a four-year-old boy who had an abscessed tooth. Ever had a toothache? Need a dentist? Have a kid at home that couldn't sleep because of a toothache? You won't forget it, mom and pop, I don't. It's part of life that you hate to go through. You have as much pain as they do just watching them suffer. Now imagine this one, she will. She's, he's four years old. His mother tried for months to get him into a dentist who could relieve his pain, but he was unable to see someone. The family was from outside the general service area of Carbondale and they had to travel several hours for every appointment. Plus, the mother just couldn't take time off work to bring her son to all the appointments. The little boy was physically, visibly nervous and afraid, as most four-year-olds would be, but he was in pain, and he knew he needed help. After the procedure was completed, the young boy began to cry, and the dentist asked him, what's wrong? And the little, all the little boy could say was, thank you. Not only was his pain gone, but the stressful journeys back and forth for the appointments were ending as well. Four years old. How is this suffering possible in my state of Illinois and in this great nation? Well, first, the United States ranks 43rd in the world for the number of dentists per capita. 43rd in the world. It's particularly outrageous in rural areas. In Illinois, 10 of our 102 counties have one dentist. In Lawrence County, Illinois, there's only one dentist for 15,000 people. 15,000. That's 11 times worse than the national average. These statistics should ring alarm bells in Washington. Now, I've been in the Senate a few years and in Congress a few years before that. And I've said many times, I've got to be careful when I say I'm going to do something about this. But I'm sure as hell going to try. When I think about that little boy waiting for a year for dental care, it's unimaginable to me as a father and grandfather. So I'm challenging myself, the Illinois delegation, our federal government, the Illinois Dental Society, and all the elected officials in this end of my state to come together, put politics over here, and do something about dental services. Mayor Harvey of Carbondale, Illinois is right. This is beneath the dignity of a great nation to have this sort of thing in our borders. Thankfully, there's a federal program that might help. It's called the National Health Service Corps. It provides scholarships and loan repayments to doctors, nurses, dentists, mental health providers who work in areas of need. It is the primary federal program intended to build a pipeline of health care providers and address shortages. 
I recently met Dr. Dana Ray, first generation college graduate and the chief medical officer of Crossing Health in Decatur. She told me that the only reason she was able to pursue her career was the loan repay <clears throat> repayment offered by the National Health Service Corps. You see, it costs a fortune to go to medical school or dental school, and they literally graduate with debts of 100,000, 200,000 and up, and then they have to take the job to pay off their loans, that's obvious. Can they go to the areas of great need? They can't get paid as much there. National Health Service Corps makes loan forgiveness part of the program. If you'll come to a community that needs a dentist, needs a doctor, we'll forgive your loan. And I'll make another mention while we're on the subject here. Senator Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee and I have a bill. The current National Health Service Corps program provides up to $50,000 loan forgiveness if you'll sign up for two years. Well, she and I want to add to that and create an incentive for those who would do five years in a community and they would have up to $200,000 of debt forgiven. Why five years? We happen to believe that dentists and doctors who practice in an area for that period of time will develop an attachment to it, start to think in terms of their family and their future there as well. So they're likely to stay after the five years is over. Another bipartisan bill, Senator Blackburn's a Republican, conservative from Tennessee, but we see eye to eye on this. The National Health Service Corps is the strongest program we have in America to tackle the shortage of dentists, doctors, and nurses. The Senate, the Senate Help Committee is negotiating on this program now, and I urge my Republican colleagues to join Democrats and do something. And let me add while we're at it, there are many health professionals around the world who desperately want to come to the United States. You know who they are, you see them in the hospitals. They're foreign born physicians and medical professionals and nurses who come here and they're there in our moment of need. We have a program to do that, but the program is too small and it doesn't allow as many to come to this country who are qualified and ready to serve as it should. What does it mean to a hospital in a rural area to lose nurses? Here's an example I was given when I visited one of these hospitals. They had four critical care nurses. Two of them announced they were leaving. Why were they leaving? Because they were gonna become traveling nurses. They will go to hospitals around the country and be paid two or three times as much as they were at this hospital. The hospital stepped back and took a look at it and said, if they leave, it's gonna threaten the future of our emergency room and the future of many of our departments, these critical care nurses. They offered them a generous, generous financial incentive to stay, and they stayed. The hospital said it was an easy calculation to make, how much more we need to pay in bonuses versus shutting down critical services in our hospital for a year because of lack of nurses. That is the reality of what hospitals are facing all over the United States, not just nurses, but many other medical professions. While we're at it, I also want to put in a word for the rural EMS agencies, first responders that we all depend on. A few years ago, I had a visit from Mark Kennedy. He's an emergency medical technician from Nauvoo, Illinois. In his county, in Hancock County, his ambulance service is critical. It's life and death to get people to the nearby hospitals 40 or 50 miles away. He told me about challenges that they had with their volunteers, by and large, running this agency, this ambulance agency, and keeping up with the equipment that's needed to make sure that they could save lives. So I joined with then Senator Pat Roberts of Kansas, who was the ranking Republican on the Senate Farm uh, Ag Committee that was writing the Farm Bill. I convinced Pat Roberts to look the other way on the question of jurisdiction and to put this bill that we call the Siren Act into the bill, into the Farm Bill, as a possible way of helping rural communities. We have now enacted it into law through Senator Roberts' efforts and my own, and we have sent $38 million to emergency medical uh, service agencies across America, including many in my state, but all across the United States. This is an equally important part of medical care in our future. Now that Senator Roberts has retired, Senator Susan Collins and I are doing the bill together, again, on a bipartisan basis to reauthorize this program. I ask any senator who has a question as to whether this is money well spent, contact that ambulance service in your own state and ask them what it means to have up-to-date equipment to save the lives of people that they're called on, on to help. I hope we can pass it out of the Senate this month. 
Mr. President, the solutions to many of our pressing health care challenges are at hand. The question is whether we can find a bipartisan commitment to move them forward. After the month of August, which I journeyed around my state, I sincerely hope that we can. I yield the floor. Suggest the absence of a quorum.